Okay. So yeah, I don't know if I have actually sent this spreadsheet to you or not. Um, but let's just do this. I'll share my screen. So I guess before we jump in, like, you know, kind of going off our conversation at before just talking about, you know, having the ability to, when you make those calls to, you know, your investors, having the information available or presenting that information. And, and so do you have, do you have thoughts or questions before I kind of jump into anything? Not really, other than it's definitely something that's needed. I mean, like, like we discussed, kind of taking it to the next level. Yeah, yeah. And and this will, like this will, um, this one 100% make you different. So let's just, let's just do this. So um, again, I really think, so let me uh, minimize this. Let's see here. Bookmark. All right, there we go. Okay. So. Um, there's a lot happening on this right now, but I want to, I want to, I want to take a step back first. So like I mentioned the other day on that, on our call, like the whole point here is, you know, when I, when I do, ba when I was doing baseball lessons a lot and the parents would say, you know, how, you know, how do I get a chance? How, how does my son or if, if the kid's, you know, 15 or something's like, how can I get a scholarship? How can I go play at Arkansas? Right. And do the, how, how can I be that, that player? And I was like, the thing is you have to be different, right? Like, Think about it this way. If you go to some showcase, right? I'm going to talk baseball for a second. Like you go to some showcase and there's 150 kids at this showcase, right? And you've got five or six schools there that are watching. You basically got to throw the ball from right field. You got three or four throws. You got to throw off the mound. You throw a couple, you know, balls across the diamond or behind the plate. And then you get like 10 swings. I mean, that's basically all you got, right? To, to prove to these coaches that you're, that you have the ability to play. Well, I was like, look, you're just like everybody else. You're like number 132 on your back, right? You're, you know, there's all these players. So I was like, you have to find a way to stand out. And so what I did literally when I was playing is, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a baseball showcase, but like what, what they would do is, you know, well, you've got four or five players kind of, you know, on deck and getting ready to hit. You've got basically 130 guys out in the outfield shagging batting practice, basically. And what I did is I was like power shagging. I was like taking reads. I was like running down balls. I was like, I wasn't diving, but I was like the only guy out there that was like getting after it in the outfield, right? To where it was like, whether I didn't get to the ball or not, it's there's that one guy out there who's number 132 out there that's just power shagging, right? And then at that mm -hmm. point, then it was, I would go up to the play and it's, oh, number 132. He's the guy that's hustling. Now it's my job to lose versus me having to go out there and try and, be different by power by by hitting home runs you see what i'm saying like i'm totally. being different before i even do anything so how that can translate over into you as a real estate agent and when you're talking to these investors again instead of making the phone call and saying hey i got this flyer from this broker and here's the rent rolls it's i'm going to send it to your inbox here in the next 15 20 minutes instead you pick up the call and say just describing that tuscaloosa building that you sent me the other day it's hey no one, I got this sick ass deal that you've got to look at. It's got a lot of a lot of buzz about it right now. So what I did is I went and talked to the broker already. He's not a really creative guy, but I know this seller is open to some seller financing. That's why I called you because I know you're a creative guy. So here's what I did. I looked up all what the lease structures were. I know there's three leases on the bottom. Only one of the proper one of the spaces is occupied. The other two are vacant. I know right now in that area of town, I talked to another one of my commercial brokers. He said we can definitely get six bucks a foot triple net, maybe even push it if it's if it's built out for that tenant it's closer to seven, seven fifty. So if we know that that's where the price is, all these leases on top, there's 12 units on the top. I know that those properties are completely occupied at this point, but I believe that we're going to have the opportunity to increase rents after the next rent cycle because of X, Y, and Z. Here's where we go in, Nolan. I ran the numbers. I really think I know you're a double digit cap rate guy. Anything below that's not going to interest you. So he's asking 4.2 million. I really think the sweet spot on this deal is to offer from 3.8, which comes in at an eight and a half cap rate. But I really think this makes sense for you because he's going to owner finance you the down payment. So even if you're bringing in a little bit less cash flow, not only are you going to be in the deal for no money, but I know you're a big depreciation guy. And this bonus depreciation that I ran on this is going to be close to almost a million dollars. So that's going to be able to offset your income. If you look in your inbox right now, I've sent you everything. I've sent you my pro forma. It's already in there. Get your eyes on it and then hit me back by the end of this business day or into business tomorrow. And let's discuss if this is something that you want to do. Talk to you later.
you see the difference between that conversation and the conversation that, hey, I got something, I'll send it to you in like an hour. Like that conversation, my ears are, and I'm like, I'm stopping what I'm doing to look in my inbox, you see? And so, I mean, and again, now that's just one way of positioning it. And of course, those metrics and understanding that stuff take some time. And again, this is a spreadsheet or a pro forma that I'll share with you. But I think there's a couple metrics um, that I wanted to share with you. This is a building I'm working on right now. I won't share the address because I don't want to compete with everybody else. But um, but basically, this is a there's a lot of this stuff on here. Um, I'll, I'll again, I'll make your own copy of this and I'll send it to you so you can kind of have it. Um, but basically, there's some metrics that you probably know already. But I want to dive a little bit deeper because there's things that are important to me as an investor that I need to know. Right? Like again, if you're saying like for example, you present me with, hey, here's the rent rolls. You know, that's that's important. I can see what the income is. You know, everyone's that's important. I can divide that by the purchase price, right? I can see what the expense are. That's important. But if you can position a couple more things for me and, and show this, hey, here's where debt is right now, right? I'm assuming knowing that you're going to want to borrow 75% from the bank. That means we're going to have to come up with 25% equity. And that's where the seller finance might come into play and it might make sense, right? So um I know this is where interest rates are right now. I just got a quote yesterday from another banker on on a deal like this. This is where debt is today. Maybe you've got a guy that can go lower, but this is how I conservatively underwrote this deal. But if you can if you can have your underwriting skills like this on deals, and then when you send these emails to your investors with all of this information on it, and say, "Hey, get back to me by end of business," because and then you 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 bullet point a couple really important metrics. Dude, I'm going to be able to pull the trigger within like 15 minutes if it's a move or if it's not a move, you know, versus saying, hey, there's a lot of buzz. Let's let's talk about it later today. By that time, it might it literally might be gone at that point, you know. So, um, so you know, we can talk about, you know, cap rates and things like that. But um, this is more on the commercial side. I know you're a residential guy, but I wanted to show a couple metrics quickly and then I'll turn it to some questions if you have anything. But um Obviously, our net cash flow is just our income after our expenses, right? Well, this is triple net. So um, just going down how this property cash flow is just hypothetically, of course, because I don't own this building yet, of course. Um, but it brings in $150,000 a year. I'm going to have a couple of concessions for losses and things. But here's my my net rental income. So here's my after I have a little bit of vacancy. I, I won't have it because it's a triple net lease. But Here's my effective gross income, right? This is basically, again, um, as we know, it's our gross income. We have our expenses and then we have our net income, right? At least with commercial, um, the gross essentially is our net income. In residential, it's different. Your gross is going to be higher. You're going to have to pay expenses out of that. And then you're going to have a smaller net income. But that's it's just that's just different. But um, a metric that's really important that I think when you're presenting to your investors that if you can go in and say, hey, here's how I underwrote this deal. I know this metric's important to you. This this debt service coverage ratio. Have you heard of that one before? Um, I've heard not really, no. Okay, okay. That's okay. So here's and again, this is this is just like a I'm hoping to help you expand your horizon. Like this is not like a talking down or anything. This is just our dialogue together. Okay. So I want you to understand that this is like if you can have these metrics like that are in that you know in your mind when you underwrite a deal and you got that number of like immediately you can start to auto populate those in your mind like just running numbers this metric so debt service coverage ratio okay imagine that this is kind of choppy but imagine the building or the property brings in one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year in net income right one hundred twenty five thousand and then we divide that by our debt service. And let's say it was $100,000. So $125,000 divided by $100,000 is going to equal a debt service coverage ratio of 1.25. Does that make sense? Following you, yep. Okay. So every time that you run the number, so if you can go into any deal, so just adding a little bit more spice to those phone calls, if, you, if you're able to run the numbers on what the debt would be, like you got the rent rolls, you got the flyer, that's great. But then you say, okay, well, what's what's going to be the debt service on, at this purchase price if he puts 25% down? So he's going to borrow 75%, whoever this investor is, he's going to borrow 75% at the market rate right now, even call it you know where debt is right now, who knows, but at debt. So we know that his debt service is going to be $85,000 a year, but it brings in basically 
143. So we know, so you just take the 143 divided by the debt service. So you see literally this net cash flow number divided by this number equals 1.69. You see how that metric shows up here? Yep. And you can, you'll see that when I share this with you, but that's a really important metric. The reason why is because this is what lenders require. It's got to be above 1.25 for the deal. For the, the, the debt service ratio is kind of the banker's like, metric if i could call it that's probably the best way of describing it it's like the debt service ratio is the banker's metric if you can have this number above 1.25 most banks will take a stab at it and if it's good enough for the banks it's probably good enough for you as an investor so um if you can get something like a really good i mean anything above 1.5 debt service ratio you know bringing in 150 and you got 100,000 of debt service that's a good that's a good debt service ratio that's a solid base hit deal um, yeah. And then, of course, these metrics down here just start showing, you know, debt service. If you have interest only, it really goes up. If you bring in a second position mortgage, which is, you know, the creative side of things and that metrics over here, you know, you can have our, oh, you got a guy that wants to carry uh, the debt, some of the down payment. Right. And you can then these blue numbers are all variables. Everything else is just um, formulated out. But um, obviously, you can see the more leverage you take on, the higher the rate of return goes up. Right. So, yep. um, so does that make sense so far, at least on the debt ratio? Yeah, I'm following you. Okay, cool. That's a, that's a, that's a really good, like if you have, if you send three bullet points, the debt ratio, you know, you can say cash, you know, cash on or cap rate X, Y, and Z debt service ratio X, Y, and Z. And then what I like to do too, or another number that's important to me is the bonus depreciation. Right. And so we've talked about this before, but do you, um, again, we a lot of people know straight line depreciation versus bonus or cost segregation. Do you you want me to go into that real quick? Do you understand that? I'm familiar, very familiar with straight line, but yeah, bonus is something that I'm not as familiar with. Okay, okay, cool. So let's just go into this. Obviously, straight and, and these are just talking about the differences. I've got this this formula here just because it's important to me. It's important to me. It's important to my investors, right? And it'll be important to your investors because again, imagine just imagine for a second, you call your guy. And say, hey, here's what this guy's asking. Here's what I think we can buy it at. Not only do you, here's what the debt service ratio is. Bam, you hammer that with a number that immediately rings in my ear. But then you also say, hey, I ran the numbers with a bonus, with the cost segregation study. You're going to basically, you're looking at about $500,000 of bonus depreciation on this building, which is probably going to give you a refund of about 170. If you're able to rattle that off just because you know what the metrics are, nobody else probably your age even knows what the hell I'm talking about. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. there, there you go. Now you're different again. So, so just this, obviously straight line is just whatever the purchase price is minus the land. So basically the value of the property and the contents inside of it, million bucks. Are you taking the tax appraised value or are you taking a, are you actually pulling comps there uh, for so, the value of the land? So no, the value of the land is based upon the assessed value that the, that the, the county okay. gives it. Yeah, that's correct. So you can find that online. Yep. So for this building, I found this $54,000 number online. So okay. found it online. This is what we're, we're actually buying this building for 1.05 million. I'm going to put about a hundred thousand into it. So I'm in it for 1.15. Um, so obviously we deduct the, the value, can't depreciate that. But in commercial, of course, it's different because we depreciate real estate over 39 years. Residential is 27 and a half, you know. So the straight line depreciation, I'm going to get $28,000 of depreciation on this. My cash flow is 58 grand minus my depreciation. I don't even have a loss here. I've got a I've got an active I got a passive income of 30 grand. I'm going to have to pay about 12 grand in taxes. This is showing it's normally negative because the cash flow is not this good. But basically, um I'm having to pay taxes even on the growth or on the on the net income on this because I don't have enough depreciation to offset my income. But let me show you to switch over here to our bonus depreciation and using a cost segregation study. So quickly, a cost segregation study um, describes what we're doing on this is we're actually grouping all of the content. So think about it this way. When you go and buy a piece of real estate, whether it's commercial, whether it's a residential apartment, let's use apartments, for example, because that's more residential for you. Let's say it's a 10 unit apartment building. Well, the building will depreciate over 27 and a half years. That's what Uncle Sam dictates is how quickly it depreciates. Well, the contents inside of the property, the dishwashers, 
the uh, sinks, the laminate floor, um, the windows, all of those other items inside of the property actually lose value or depreciate at a faster speed or faster rate of scale. Does that make sense? They're, they 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 lose the carpets. Every like they all lose value quicker than 27 and a half years. And so what a cost segregation study is or an engineer will do is he'll come into that apartment building. You hire him, you can have your accountant do it, but you can hire this guy and he'll come in and find all these items that are inside of that property, group all of them. To, so again, you've got 10 dishwashers, you've got 10 sinks, you've got 10 everything for each unit. He'll group all of these these items together and the contents together and with bonus depreciation you can essentially accelerate the depreciation into the very first year so imagine a brand new dishwasher for an apartment is 500 bucks hypothetically right mm -hmm. if you depreciate 500 dollars over 27 and a half years you're talking like 30 bucks a year right like that's not i mean how boring is that but you've got so so talking you know 300 bucks for 10 for 10 total dishwashers right but if you're paying 5000 or 500 bucks of, uh, of each dishwasher and you accelerate that that depreciation into the very first year you're able to now take a 5000 i think it's 5000 right 2500 whatever the number is 2500 yeah 5000 dollars into the very first year that's an actual loss on paper okay so what ends up coming to be is if you've done enough of them and you'll what you'll come to find out is it equals about 30% of the purchase price of every, and sometimes it's 28%, sometimes it's 32%. So basically, if it's a million dollar apartment building, a million dollars, you're looking at having a bonus depreciation deduction through a cost segregation study of about 300 grand. Does that make sense? Do you follow that? It's kind of a couple different words, but like, you're going to be able to take bonus depreciation from the cost segregation study, which allows you to essentially accelerate the depreciation of all the contents inside of a property and front load that loss into the very first year of purchase. So again, a million dollar building in this position, in this particular case, 1.15 million. Again, the same value of the land is 54 grand. So we got the same content or the same value. But if we take Again, about 30% deduction here, $328,000 of passive loss, okay? Which is just a phantom expense in Uncle Sam's eyes, okay? So that's what our value of our building is now is $767,000 to depreciate. And then we get to depreciate that at 2.56% a year. So our total depreciation deduction is, if you go all the way down here, is almost $350,000 versus twenty eight grand if you do straight line. All right, so I got I'm I'm off thrown off here by Hit the me. the three twenty eight when you multiply by two point five six. Okay, so here the three twenty eight the three twenty eight is oh you're taking the, the value of the building excuse me there I you go the there I you go my bad I'm sorry there. I'm good you're in yep okay cool so we're taking one point zero nine five minus three twenty eight yep. to equal seven sixty seven does that That's make it. sense so here's our bonus depreciation initially is the thirty percent of the value of the property right. Mm -hmm. And so this is what is actually left of depreciation of depreciation on this building. Now you can depreciate the 767 over the remaining 38 years. So we'd multiply this, or I guess 39 years. So we multiply this by 2.56, which equals $19,000 per year. So if you if you if you add the 19 the, the 328, which is this number, which is 30 percent of the value, Plus the annual deduction of nineteen thousand, that's going to equal almost three hundred fifty thousand dollars of first year depreciation. Does that make sense? Did you see how that went down there? You follow that? Yes. Okay. So where it gets really cool is now we go over here to the tax consequences. This is this is where it rings the bell for me. This is what's important to me because I have I have you know earned income too. My wife and I have earned income, same as you. So. Here's the cash flow from the building. Remember, it was the same cash flow as over here, the $58,000. Same cash mm -hmm. flow from the property. Now, we've got this $348,000 of passive loss, okay? So that's going to equal $289,000 of a passive loss on our books on this building this year, okay? Now, if you're a real estate professional, which again, I think we've spoken about this, but 
You got to have seven. You you are deemed a real estate professional. It's do you spend over half of your time in real estate or equal or above 750 hours in real estate? That's basically being a real estate professional. But what that allows you to do is take what is normally a passive loss because here's the here's the kicker. The way the Uncle Sam views this, there's three buckets. You've got passive, you've got earned income, you've got portfolio income, and you've got passive income. Your active income is when you go and trade your time for money at your job. Your portfolio income is where you buy low and sell high, right? You put money in the stock market, you hope and pray it goes up. And then passive income is where you're not really involved in earning income. It's rental real estate, right? So there's those three buckets of income. Well, in Uncle Sam's eyes, you can't cross-pollinate income and losses, they have to stay in their own buckets. So if you have active income, you can't deduct that against a passive loss in real estate like this. So for most investors or most people that are higher income earners, this $348,000 doesn't really help them regarding their, their earned income because they're earning their income. They're not in real estate full time. So what we show people how to do, of course, is like, you know, have your spouse become a real estate professional because then what happens is this passive loss now becomes an active loss. It shifts buckets. So now sure. this $289,000 of deduction or passive loss is able to offset against active income. So to go down here to your refund here, a $289,000 passive loss, if someone is in a 40% tax bracket, call them a million dollar earner that you know is an orthopedic surgeon or something, He's in the highest tax bracket. This is what his, so this will this will be what the deduction that, so if you look at it this way, this is what his equals a potential refund of $115,000. So if you look at the, this green number is basically the cash flow plus the, the refund. refund that he would get. So 58,000 plus 15,000 equals 174. So that's basically, so if you think about it, this is what his refund would be at the end of the year. Um, for tax purposes is $115,000 in a tax refund just by buying this building. And if you do it creatively, you're out of it. You're out of pocket, no money. And that would be for you and I's position being in real estate. Now go back to an orthopedic surgeon. His is not going to, he's not going to get that 289 number has nothing to do with him. As of, as of in his current situation, it would not have anything to do with him. So where you and I can come into play and how you can even educate your clients more is saying, hey, what's your spouse doing? Is she at the country club this week? Let's go see if we can go have her go to a couple open houses. Let's If she if she likes to run spreadsheets, well, let's have her run some numbers on some properties. If she likes to go you know, drink Prosecco, well, let's go have her do some open houses because that's a real estate activity. And so we can have her their spouse be a real estate professional because they're going to file their taxes together. And as long as the spouse is the real estate professional, this orthopedic surgeon gets to take that against his earned income. Definitely. Cool. So, cool. so that's kind of where it gets cool is the cash flow is awesome, right? Because that was, if he's making $90,000 a month, he's not going to go crazy over four or five grand in cash flow. But if you think about it this way, Haynes, like think about it from an orthopedic surgeon's perspective. All he knows how to do is trade his time or high income earners, they trade their time for money, right? Not investors, just high income earners, right? So if you can position it this way in their mind, dude, think about it this way. If someone is making even $800,000 a year and they're bringing in 60 grand a month, this $115,000 of tax refund, think about it, that just added two more months of earnings to their life in that month. They work 12 months of their life for 60 grand. So 60 grand a month for 12 months, $115,000. They got paid for 14 months. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So they ex essentially extended their working efforts by another 60 days. So if you put your mindset in their shoes, that's my, that might resonate with them. It's like, hey, when you get this refund, dude, I know you're working for you know the clock every day. You just added two more months of, of grind and work to your life. You squeeze 14 months of work into 12 months. That makes sense. Yeah, so that might yeah. be a way that you can position that. Um, all right, does that depreciation? Do, do you do you understand that? Is that is that helpful? Totally. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's just a good. If you understand that, that's just a really good. Um, in my opinion, that's a separator, dude. That's a game changer. Just having your clients know that you understand depreciation, and you understand the difference between straight line and bonus. Um, it's going to help educate your clients too, because you'd be shocked at how many people just do straight line. 
And if you present them with this strategy and you've got these numbers to back it up, and then you even go further and say, hey, I've even got an account that already does this for all of my clients already. I'd love to hook you up with them. And you can poke, you know, you can uh, pick his brain about it if you, you know, if this doesn't make sense. And I'll, and I'll hook you up with my guy. But that, Let me dude, ask you this that's the way quick. I would look at it. Yeah, go ahead. Just so I'm fully wrapping my head around it. So, and the people that are listening can, can yeah. kind of put this in play too. But all right, let's say I have a very well off, a uh, client who does not work, they're leveraging an old real estate portfolio, buying new things, um, kind of, you know, the name of the game, the dream for any real estate investor. What, I guess it comes to them where you kind of have to get personal and you ask them, hey, how do you file your taxes? Like, are you call, are you, before I show them, hey, you have this chance to do bonus depreciation, are you filing as a real estate professional? Like, you see what I'm saying? I, I mean, yeah. I've got a guy that would be, he'd own 200 Pass, you know, assets that are in the passive bucket that he's paying taxes on every year, but because he is constantly managing those and renting them out and showing them, he's essentially a real estate professional without a real estate license. How does he file? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonna, Good question. Good question. Kind of like and, you. I mean, yeah, kind of like you. How are you? You don't have a real estate license, but you're always in the game. Like, how right. do you benefit this for yourself? Well, the, here's the thing is the real estate professional status, according to Uncle Sam, does not require you to have a license. It's not. Perfect. It's just the Perfect. only two metrics or boxes that you have to check are you spend half of your time in real estate, and which equals over 750 hours a year or basically two hours a day. And so that's why when I say you got a high income, or let, let's just go back to the example of your guy. If he's managing these properties, dude, I mean- yeah, imagine you drive. Okay, let's let's say Haynes. For, let's say that you weren't a real estate agent and you weren't in real estate every day, and you had a one rental property in Birmingham, but you live in Tuscaloosa, right? That's an hour there. You spend an hour managing it or doing whatever you need, and you drive an hour home. You just spent three hours in real estate that day. Yeah, think about it that way. So, like the the government, because because if you really want to get philosophical here, the government is trying to encourage us to buy real estate because they're not very, you've seen the projects before. Everybody's seen when the government steps in and tries to do real estate things. They're not very good at it. So sure. what they do is they try to incentivize people like you and I to sell it, to buy it, to invest in it. And so if they can do that through allowing us to keep more of our money in our pocket, that allows us to go do more things for them. Because think about all those apartments. Let's go back to that 10 unit apartment building. You got 10 tenants, right? They're either going to school, they're working, maybe they're retired. You know, I, I don't know what the situation is, right? But they're paying rent to you every single month. So that means that's allowing for property taxes to be paid to keep the city nice, to pay the mayor and the school systems, all that stuff. So that's helping the, that's helping the municipality. But all 10 of those people, let's say they're college students. Well, they all go to school at the university, which pays tuition, which pays for the professors to earn income, to pay income tax on. And then those professors have to live somewhere and they pay rent or they own real estate and they pay property taxes. Or let's say everyone's you know a working individual. They go and work their job and they pay income tax. So if you think about it this way, the government is okay with people like you and I, the smaller majority, keeping more of our money in order to provide living facilities or occupation opportunities for people, for the masses, because they know that they're going to get that money back in regards to their income tax. Does that kind of make sense? following you that makes yeah sense. so that's kind of that's the philosophical kind of view of real estate in my opinion but um but but for your guy talking about managing all those rentals dude i mean he's a hundred percent a real estate professional and if he doesn't have an accountant that doesn't understand that or he's never filed he's never filed that i mean he's just mathematically simply leaving money on the table like just simply leaving money on the table it'd be foolish for him to to not take this it'd be it would be foolish it's actually if you look at the Again, I won't get all tax on you, but if you're not taking this deduction, um, it's on you. Like the government's giving it to you. Like they're asking you to take it. So if you don't take this passive, like if you don't take this bonus depreciation, it's 100% on you. Like they're they're asking you, they're they're making the rules for us for us to 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 take this deduction. So, um, and no okay. one more thing. You yeah, mentioned yeah. year one a couple times. Like, let's say that my client who we're, we're referencing, you know, Johnny Appleseed here. Yeah. If let's say he's owned these properties for 10 years and he's just been doing bond depreciation, how can you come in and can you counter it? Like, can you start at 10 years 
or is it something that you have to purchase and like homesteading needs to be done in the first year? How does that work? No, you absolutely, you can take bonus depreciation at any given point, right? So okay. if you were to do straight line depreciation on this building and you get down to, again, you know, year 10, right? Now there's only, I don't know the math off of this, but now there's only $800,000 of bonus depreciation left on this property. Well, guess what? You can still take that 30% against what you haven't depreciated yet. Okay. So, so you're one, you would so off the 1.15 and you count X amount and then you do that until really it's only going to last you though roughly nine years, 10 years. Or can you, once the property is depreciated because you're still having to, how, like, how does that work? I want, in essence, if the whole property has been depreciated, then what are your next steps? Are you just taking yeah. individual, are you, are you trying to find the next project? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where the, where the bonus depreciation really comes into play is it, it encourages you to keep buying, it encourages you to keep doing deals. Yeah. So like, you know, if you if you own a building for again a commercial building for thirty nine years, I'm actually working on a deal right now with a guy. He's actually owned a building for over forty years, which is just bonkers. He hasn't sold it or anything, but um, but yeah. So so if he's depreciated his properties out over the twenty seven and a half or the thirty years or whatever, you know, whatever he is in his timeline, I mean, you basically you don't have a deduction of depreciation anymore. Once you once you've gone all the way out, you've gone all the way out. So. The solution is, of course, is to sell that property, recapture it, or ten thirty one into something else, and then restart that depreciation clock. Like, okay, because my whole thought, dude, is like, and when I go and I buy buildings, Haynes, this is to distill it down. When I'm investing in a building, and you and you present something to me, the most important thing that I think about is I want to acquire two things. I want to borrow money, and I want the depreciation deduction because those two things are the most valuable aspects of real estate. The reason being, and I mentioned this before, but if I go back to um, just my debt, okay? Let's just look at this property cash flow metric for a second. I want you to look at, so what, what you can anticipate, at least in commercial real estate, is I've got revenue growth here of 3% each and every year. Smith, what's up, dude? What's up? How, How you doing, bro? Good to see you. Good to see you, man. So what I've got here is I've got this revenue growth of 3%. Haynes, you see this, this percentage? So that mm -hmm. basically just says same thing as your residential tenants. Rent's <clears> going <throat> to go up, you know, a hundred bucks every other year, you know, whatever, right? Well, I've got it in my contracts and my leases with my tenants, commercial tenants, that the rents are going to go up every year. And they're okay with that because if you think about it from my tenant's perspective, rent is just a fixed cost. So they know they got to run their business with rent being a part of that baseline cost to run their business. So if they can see for four, five, eight years out in a row, a roadmap of what it's going to cost them to run their business, it helps them be more efficient. That's why commercial leases are so much longer and they're so much more consistent because it helps the, the landlord because he's got consistent income and it helps the tenant because he knows that he's got a good roadmap of what he can see into the future of what his fixed costs are going to be on his balance sheet, if that kind of makes sense, or at least a statement of cash flow. So but this is what I was mentioning, the two most important aspects. So if you've got cash flow, I want you to look at this. This year one, you can see your year one, year one column is 143. Year two is 148. Year th three is 152. And it goes up, right? 3% every year. You see this, okay? But think about it this way. Let me look at my amortization schedule. I pay 7,000 a month in debt service every single month, Right. My income goes up every single year, every year on the building, and my debt remains the same. So the whole point of real estate is not to own real estate, not to own buildings because that requires maintenance. You don't want to own buildings because you because you want to have tenants because that requires management. Hey. And you don't really, yeah, the reason why you want to buy real estate is because you want to acquire debt. Because when you go and borrow money, your debt stays the same. And the value of the building appreciates and the rents go up. They always go up over time. Can you imagine owning a building back in like 1980 or apartment in Tuscaloosa back in 1980? What were the rents back then? Like a hundred bucks a month. Rents are now what, two yeah. grand a month in Tuscaloosa? I mean, can you yeah, imagine dude. that? They always go up. Values always appreciate and the rents always go up. So, but your debt stays the same. Imagine somebody buying that building uh, on university back in 1980. That thing was probably worth 200 grand. Now it's worth four and a half million. You see, you see what I'm saying this? So like the whole point of it 
is to borrow money because debt will stay the same. And yeah, you pay interest to somebody else, which is deductible, but your debt stays the same. Your rents go up and the building appreciates all the while you're even paying principal down. But that's most important, but then also because you want depreciation because this deduction is going to be able to go to offset against your earned income. And again, that's the real estate professional status that a lot of your investors that you call are. But if you can think about it from a perspective of debt and depreciation, and you can present those, those deals to your investors with those two metrics in mind, debt depreciation, your more sophisticated investors are going to be eaten out of the palm of your hand, like straight up and down. That's the way that if you call me and you focus on debt and depreciation, that's going to be you, you've got my ears flared up. You've got me, uh, you've got me wanting to drive to Tuscaloosa to look at what you got. You know what I mean? For sure. So, um, and that's kind of, that, that, that's kind of, and again, these are, um, these assumptions and things like that. You can, um, mix this up. They all have different, different metrics. Um, you know, the rent, the, the rent per square foot, that's just basically the rent divided by the square footage. You know, that'll, you know, if I make this 13,000, it'll change the rent per foot, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. If I change the, you know, the square footage, it'll change. Um, do you have, do you have questions? Do you have any thoughts about any of this stuff? Um, I mean, there are some knickknacky things in here. Like for example, a hurdle rate, that's a term I'm familiar with. <laughs> yeah. Let's go into this. So this hurdle number, there's a couple metrics that go into this. So this hurdle number is something that's important to me when I'm presenting a deal to investors, right? This is a number that I always kind of use as 10% because I like to give investors a double digit rate of return on whatever I'm whatever I'm doing. Okay. So there's a there's a metric here. Where is my here it is returns? There's a metric here. It's called the WAC. Can you see this where it says the weighted average cost of capital? Okay. And you can look that metric up. But basically, what if I could distill it down to one sentence? If your WAC is higher then your cash on cash return, the deal is a no-go, okay? You always wanna make sure that your cash on cash, so if I go back to assumptions and I go down here to my debt service coverage ratio, but then I go all the way down to my cash flow to equity, you see this number where it says 17.7%? Uh -huh. I wanna make sure that my cash on cash return is always above the weighted average cost of capital. And the reason why that hurdle number is important, so let's so right now it's 8.31, right? So if I go up here and change this hurdle number to 12%, what's that going to do to the returns? It is going to make the whack go up. It's basically saying that my cost of capital is going to become more expensive. And this is just a, a weight between me borrowing money from somebody else and my amortized debt with a bank. And there's an... Yeah. The, the depending upon the leverage, the weight of leverage, like if I have a hundred percent leverage with the bank, you know, it's it's the whack is going to be more weighted towards permanent debt. If I've got, you know, only 10% with the bank and 90% with the private money guy, the, 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 the weight of that weighted average cost of capital is going to be weighted more towards my private investor. So it, it just depends upon which way the, the, the leverage is shifted more to, um, a second position lien holder or like a, a hard money guy or to permanent debt. And so this is just, and you can see all these metrics are popped up in here so that you can, you know, you can run the numbers yourself, but to distill down the weighted average cost of capital, make sure that your cash on cash return is always higher than this metric. So if you've got something that's double the weight of average cost of capital, you've got a really good basic deal. Okay. Now, how did you pick 10? Like, how did you come up with that hurdle rate? Um, you can, it, it's, so I kind of use this, if I'm borrowing money from somebody else, like let's say if I, I bought a building last year and I borrowed 80% from the bank and then I had a hard money guy come and I gave him 12% interest, right? Like, um, and I borrowed his money and he took a second position and I bought the building basically for no money down. So what I did is I put this hurdle number in at 12%. That's what I'm paying him every single month. And of course, my cash flow, you know, services that debt and everything. Everybody's happy. Um, but this is just basically whatever I negotiate with a private list, uh, investor. So if you just took 80% from a bank, let's say permanent financing, would that number, do you have to have anything there? No, 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 you don't. Th this is just okay. for, uh, yeah, this hurdle number is just for like investors. It's just if you if you took on a second investor with you. Perfect. Okay. Cool. So 
um, when you're looking at like, so this number, if you can see here, if you just, if you brought, let's say 80% here, what this will pop up here is the equity that you'll have to inject. Sure. And that number, and that number populates from the estimated settlement statement. So you can see here, you know, this is what be what will be due from the buyer. You've got all your debits and your credits. Um, and again, this is all, you know, you can, as I'll share mine with you, you can make it your own and you can kind of create your own settlement statement, the ones that are more from, you know, the one, the, the metrics that you, or the, the, you know, the cost that you see pop up most of the time on your closing statements. Um, yeah. I like to overestimate, you know, because I know that if I'm borrowing, you know, 20%, my equity really isn't 275 grand. It's closer to 215. So realistically, all of these numbers are going to just be higher. Like all my rate of returns are going to be higher. So, okay. but I just like to be conservative because then when I present my offers to investors and to bankers, I say, hey, you're going to earn 23% on this. And then we come back the year later and it's like, oh shit, we earned 31%. Hey, I got another deal. You want to get, you want to tango? And they immediately want to want to party with me, you know? Perfect. Yeah. So- um, that's just kind of the way that I, that I've, um, you know, the whole, the, the song and dance of under promise over deliver kind of thing. So, um, and then of course, like when you exit, here's just the exit cap rates. These are just, um, you know, what this will do is this will just show like, and this is obviously with commercial, the, the sales price is based upon the income of the building. So like, if you know that in year five, if I'm going to exit in five years, I go down here to year five and I see what my cash flow is, 161,000. I divide that by my cap rate. That's another variable here. It's going to spit out this purchase price or this sales price to what somebody will buy this thing at. So yep. um, basically a million dollar net, you know, straight up and down. Like if we go back to this settlement statement, I work out to basically earn $1.2 million in a net. So. Sweet. Plus all the cash flow, you know, everything like that. So now you got to recapture depreciation. You got to pay capital gains if you don't 1031, of course. But um, still not a bad day for somebody that's going to do that deal, you know. For sure. So does that all kind of make sense? Is that I, I hope that, that 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 I'm answering some questions or at least I'm bringing some value to you. No, great value. Um, it's something that I've got to sit here and kind of fool around with for a minute. Yeah. Obviously, being in residential, these are a lot more metrics than we have to use to solidify a deal. Yeah. So it just as I kind of creep into the commercial game, I got to really familiarize myself with some of this. But no, this is huge and it definitely will help me kind of take it to the next level and be able oh, to dude, you will. better deals, brother. Bro, it 100% will. And because um, again, like, you, you know, you can stay in residential. Like, this, you know, this, this just, uh, what this will do though, it will just make you a sharper real estate agent, period. Dot. Uh -huh. You're understanding. Cause this is, cause again, this is just what, like, this is, this is what's important to me. Like I built this, this has taken me like about four years to build out how I want it. But this is, these metrics, of course, I look at this every day. So I, I know what I'm looking at, but you familiarize yourself with this and you begin to like run numbers, even if it's a residential house and you just like run these numbers and you see what the rent per foot is and you see, you know, what's the value, you know, you, you understand how to, how these things correlate and, and how the relationships are between these metrics Dude, you're going to be able to make faster decisions on if it's a deal makes sense or you don't have to drive somewhere because you see what the rent per foot is in that area based upon the comps. Like it's just going to make you sharper, you know? Mm -hmm. Totally. So, but yeah, dude, here's what I'll do. We'll get off of here. I'll share this with you or I'll I'll make a copy of mine and I'll um and I'll make you the owner up. It'll, it'll ask you for permission to be the owner and then you can just take it and run with it as much or as little as you want, man. And then of course, I'll always be here for questions and thoughts and everything in between, man. Cause there's some other metrics on here that we really didn't get into, but it's not, some of these other things aren't really all that important, you know? Um, just Let me a do couple some of digging them. And we'll, we'll yeah. circle back up. But no, I mean, what you just gave me was a ton of great information. So I need to start there. Yeah. That's awesome, dude. Well, cool, bro. That sounds good, man. Um, thanks for hopping on today. Hope it was, it was good. We will, um, I'll get this over to you here this early this afternoon. And then, um, man, just holler at me, call me if anything else changes, man. I'll do it, brother. Go get you a championship tee. <laughs> That's right. We'll try, dude. All right, All bro. Right, no I'll talk to you later, man. See you. Thanks Hank. as always, brother. Of course. See you. Bye-bye.